on the Scientific American blogs page, you see a blog by British paleontologist Doreen Naish. The article is called Brian J. Ford's Aquatic Dinosaurs, 2014 edition. On this post, Naish is saying that Brian J. Ford has what he calls a ridiculous idea that the dinosaurs were mostly aquatic and they had their huge tail. And it doesn't make sense in evolutionary sense he's saying that the tail would be supported by walking on land because it's so heavy and it's not there for anything. And then the water the dinosaur would be able to support all that huge weight. Nash goes on to discuss about how the dinosaurs have adaptations that are like a large elephant with a head and a tail. And they have relatively small feet. They're more flat and they're not rounded so much. And one thing I note about this is that we say that elephants are actually adapted for life in the water. They actually are adapted for life in the water. And this is why these are trunks for like island hopping in the Mediterranean. It's thought that in our evolution, many of the mammals, including us, had gone into the water in their evolution, like the dolphin or the manatee or us. This is offered by some to be true and I have reasons to believe this may be so, as I see on my other posts. Nash goes on to say that during the evolution of the idea about the dinosaurs themselves, much time was spent disproving the idea that it was actually aquatic, as the brontosaurs weren't in the swamps, that there weren't any brontosaurs anymore, because they named them something else. Like, if you count a lot and you're good at math, and they start adding those letters to the algebra, it's something more like words, and a lot of the mathematicians go, wow, wow, they just lose count. Nash speaks of the improvements they're making about Spinosaurus, the dinosaur spines. And this one has definitely been proven to be water dwelling. It has the sail on the back like a sailfin fish, and it has the feet that are designed for, you know, like splayed out like a duck's web feet. And he goes on to say that they made some part of their time in the water, but mostly they weren't in the water. For example, he talks about how the hadrosaurs have plant remains from walking on land, the land plants in their stomach. And their teeth show signs of grinding like they're grinding up plants that are on land. Even so, Nash says that the birds were evolved from the dinosaurs, and a lot of them are water animals. Even so, he's saying that the, the dinosaurs spent some time in the water, but mostly they weren't water dwelling animals. He notes that the large theropods, brontosaurus, apatosaurus, whatever, they had pneumatization. They had air sacs in their bones, like birds. And so they've been so light, like 80% air, they've been top heavy. You may have heard of the self riding ship in the Navy. And basically, if it goes upside down, it just goes right side up. It's not Australian. And so this ship knows how to write itself. And it's really easy to know how to write yourself if you're in the center of your gravity. I don't think the dinosaur was a major part of the Earth's center of gravity, but a dinosaur like a patasaurus could have stayed balanced with its tail and its feet somewhat. And I think it's not impossible they may have spent a major part of their time in the water, actually. I think this is not impossible. Because as I said, the elephants, the, the dinosaur like the brontosaurus is made like an elephant then we would say that it's not necessarily so impossible that even though it has small feet like the elephant rolls to its size, it still would have been water dwelling to a considerable extent. One important thing that we note is that dinosaurs had no arthritis. The giant dinosaurs had no arthritis. And so I think of the possibility that the dinosaurs really were both land and water dwelling, like the elephants. They basically went on the land and there their tail would get tired and they would be sort of with an old, old case of arthritis, really a senior. And so they <laughs> want to go back to the water for some relief from all that pain of supporting all the weight. This is why the dinosaurs didn't get arthritis, because of the soothing mineral bath of the oceans of the mineral ages. And I think two things are worth researching here. First of all, how good could their tail have kept them moving in the water and balanced them? And also, how near were those dinosaurs to the water? The fossils we find, what percentage of them are near the water? Today, 75% of the life lives next to the shore. 75% of the people, if you're a fish, you really have a good swimming pool with a view. But the wave-powered ships, easier than a business selling splunking tours, it'll never go under and has low overhead. Ford also says that the hadrosaurs with their flattened out bills and their tubes for breathing, these are signs of being aquatic but they say they find in their stomachs remains from more on land. But I wouldn't say it's impossible to say how much more on land. Perhaps they really were different from other swimming animals, and so it took less energy to keep them moving with their tail, just as we say that in research about how pterodactyls flew, 
They're different from a bat. They're different from a bee. They're different from a bird. They're different from all other flying animals. So we can say it's not impossible to maybe have a different physiology involved that Nash hasn't considered yet. So we may want to research how close the dinosaurs are to the water and for what reason they were there. If water offered them relief from the land, then we may say that we ask what percentage of the dinosaurs were near the shore. Research is being done about why the dinosaurs never got arthritis. It's being considered that the dinosaurs are actually not cold-blooded or warm-blooded either one, but something in between. And if the world had really good weather for like 200 million years when the dinosaurs were there, we would say that they were not too hot on land, not too cool in the water because the water was warmer. And so this may be why and how they're able to go in the water. It's been said that the birds and mammals are lucky to have not been hit by the dinosaur asteroid. But it turns out that the comet, then we've been luckier because we haven't been hit by it. It's not believed that it may have been a comet or that it will be eventually anyhow. It's believed that the extension events may go in cycles for the Oort cloud or the outside of the cloud. The Kuiper belt is kind of inside the outer cloud. So when the Earth moves in sort of a gravitational situation with the stars moving near it, or the right type, or above and below the plane of the ecliptic of the galaxy where there's different gravity, this may cause more of those asteroids to go in and cause extinction events in cycles. Kind of like Mark Twain when he was born, he said he was really active when he said that, and he said he was going out with Halley's Comet, which was 76 years later, and sure enough he did. But no word yet whether he reappeared in 1986. What an editor. You may know that the largest ecosystems in diversity are the Great Barrier Reef and the rainforests of the Amazon, but you may not know that the estuaries are actually where most of the life lives. So if the dinosaurs are like life now, perhaps most of them would have actually lived near the water and used their tail as a way to swim. With all that buoyancy, it wouldn't have taken that much extra power to swim, like fish do. They wouldn't have nearly as tough time to move through the water so much. Sort of like how a ship can move through the water more easily than a submarine with the same amount of power, ships have far more power to carry weight than submarines. So I say that Nash is correct that the dinosaurs were either completely land-bound or completely water-bound, and he's correct to say that they were both. My question is, what degree could they have been in the water more, perhaps, and this may be why they didn't get arthritis. One real thing I want to say also about dinosaurs is they didn't have to worry about their weight because when they see the machine, how could they see the readout with their stomach in the way? I would say for whatever reason, if the dinosaurs had tooth wear by land plants or whatever, then this would be enough to cause their bones to wear and give them arthritis. So the idea that land plant use was always associated with tooth wear would also tell us there's also no explanation for this. But if the dinosaurs had been both in the water and on land, more in the water, and they wouldn't have gotten arthritis, and their teeth could have worn by some land plant consumption also. A pterosaur flies like a pterosaur. A bird flies like a bird. A bee flies like a bee. A bat flies like a bat. So perhaps a dinosaur, actually, would swim more like a ship than a usual submarine. And this might be more why the dinosaurs were involved with the water. How could a dinosaur get around on land much easily with that huge tail? If you try to hold your arms out to your side, it's like kind of looking at the computer monitor for hours and holding your eyes up against the weight of the, the muscles of your eye. It causes them to be stressed. One of the real methods I see on my other videos about solving computer eye strain is to place your monitor so you're always looking downward. If you balance your eye in the center, it takes major stress off your eyes. Like the elephants and other land mammals that have evolved into the water and back out, like the elephant, as you say, the pig, they go in the mud. They like to go around the mud and take a mud bath of all those minerals. They're getting huge amounts of minerals, which Linus Pauling, who won the Nobel Prize for vitamin C or whatever, he's saying that minerals are the breath of life. In the first missions to Mars, when they did the life experiments, they decided to see if the clay would actually breathe. What they found was the clay actually breathes like it's got life. So it's starting the processes of metabolism of life, which Carl Sagan asks in Cosmos, his great book, that, that was actually causing the first life to form. And then these cells, as they were starting to evolve, they picked up on this and incorporated that machine into their own machine to then evolve the cellular process of respiration essential to life. As we ask why the dinosaurs got so huge, perhaps the water was much more comfortable than water today because the weather was so much better. And also, they had a large power base of good weather. But I think it's mostly because they were in the water around the edge of all the good weather, and they went on the land considerably, but not perhaps as much.
I would considered the possibility that the Ice Age mammals got so large because of similar issues about heating. Water tends to radiate away too much heat, so the dinosaurs wouldn't build up their heat. And the Ice Age mammals also had those minerals as the glaciers would advance and retreat each year. They're digging out huge amounts of minerals, which those mammals would have gotten access to. They have very great nourishment. And so the dinosaurs have gotten a lot of nourishment in the mud by staying in the mud and the water, like the elephant and a lot of the other mammals that evolved into the water and then moved back out. A lot of them may have evolved back out also. And the idea that water is not a major part of evolution, I think, is not out of the question.